Good morning, Trigsters. Today we are going to move on and start looking at a topic that's called vectors. Now, vectors is a skill and a concept that we will actually study from now until the end of the school year. So let's get right into it. Um, as you are studying geometry and physics, some of the topics that you cover are things like area, time, and temperature. Now, those types of problems, you can actually have a solution that is a single real number. Your area, think about in geometry when you had to find the area of a shape. Your solution was a single real number. However, if you ever study something like force and velocity, you cannot have just a single real number because force and velocity, they involve both what's called magnitude and direction. So you would have to have two values. Now, just to keep this easy for you guys, magnitude means the length. So if you want to find the length of something, what we'll be using is the distance formula from geometry. Now, direction. In mathematical terms, direction, what it's actually talking about is the slope. Is the line rising? Is it falling? How steep is it? So magnitude you find using the distance formula, and we'll practice this. Direction is found using the slope formula. But when you have things like force and velocity, you can't just have a single number. You need a value that represents the magnitude or length and a value that represents the direction or slope. And that's what we're gonna be looking at. That's kind of like an introduction to what's called a vector. To represent a quantity where you do need both of these um, magnitude and direction, both of those two items, you use what's called a directed line segment. And that is shown here in figure 6.15. I did take a lot of visuals out of our textbook, you guys, just to make sure that you do get to see what it looks like. Now, in the past when I've taught trig, lots of people look at this and they're like, well, isn't that just a ray? And you're right, it does look very much like a ray. So let's right away, before we get too far, compare a directed line segment with a ray. So a ray, let's say I had ray PR. Now this is something that you would have covered in geometry. A ray has an ending point, but it goes continuous forever and ever and ever in whatever direction the arrow is pointing, okay? So this is a ray. If you are labeling a ray, it is the starting point where your line is going, and that's what it looked like. Now here's the big difference, okay? This is a directed line segment. So notice it says P and it says R. Here's the difference. A line segment means that it stops, okay? So it's starting at P, it's ending at R. This arrow is there to show you the direction because in a directed line segment, you're using this for problems that need both a length and a direction. So they need an arrow so you know what's called the initial side or the, or sorry, the initial point. I'm used to graphing on the, on the coordinate plane. Your initial point is where you start. Your terminal point is where you stop. This arrow is there to show you direction. The way that you label a directed line segment, it would look like this. So notice it's not a full arrow. This means that it has direction, but it does not continue forever in that direction. So it has the direction, but it is not continuous. It stops. You will notice a lot of the vocab words are going to sound familiar. Initial point, terminal point. When we graphed on a coordinate plane, um, when we were graphing those standard angles, remember we had our initial side where we had our vertex at the origin. The initial side was on the x-axis pointing to the right. The ray that could move was the terminal ray. So same type of vocab you're gonna see initial for your starting point, terminal for your ending point. Let's keep going. The directed line segment, in this case it's PQ, has an initial, and that's what I was just kind of pointing out is some of the vocab's gonna be the same. This is where you start, and a terminal, this is where you end. So there is a start and there is an end. Its magnitude is its length. And so what that means is if you know the two ordered pairs for P and Q, you can find the magnitude or its length using the distance formula. How far is it from the starting point to the ending point? And remember distance formula from geometry. You'll take your second X, 
minus your first x. You always do what's in parentheses first, so find that difference, square it. Your second y minus your first y, find the difference, square it. Take those two values, add them together, then take the square root, and that is your magnitude. And when they're talking about magnitude, this is the notation that they use. So it's kind of like a double absolute value is what it looks like. And again, it's your directed line segment. So this can be found using the distance formula. Now, if you are going to find the direction, okay, this is magnitude. So if you want to find magnitude, it is the distance formula. If you want to find direction, the direction is actually the slope. So remember, you'll have your two ordered pairs because you'll have your initial point and your terminal point. The slope, which is the direction, is the second y minus the first y over the second x minus the first x. So in this section, you will be doing the distance formula and the slope formula. Kind of fun. Um, here is what a vector is. Now, two directed line segments that have the same magnitude. Magnitude is length or distance from the starting point to the ending point and the direction, which is the slope. They are equivalent. So in order for two directed line segments to be what's called equivalent, they must be the exact same length. There's the same distance between the start and the end, and their slope has to be the same. So for example, this is another visual from your book. 6.16, all of these are equivalent directed line segments. If you actually took a ruler and you went ahead and measured all the lengths, they would be the same. They all have the same slope. That's why they're parallel. You can notice that if you were to extend all of them, they would not cross. So that's what an equivalent directed line segment is. Same slope, same length. The set of all directed line segments that are equivalent to a given directed line segment is a vector. So that's what a vector is. A vector is a big set. It's all the directed line segments within a certain area that are equivalent to a line segment. So if these, if all of these have the same magnitude and same direction, this is a vector of that directed line segment. Kind of cool, it's just a set of directed line, plane, nine, uh, line segments, okay? When you're talking about vectors, they are denoted by lowercase and bold letters. So when you see a lowercase bold letter, what that means is they're talking about a vector. A vector means you have a set of directed line segments. Every line segment in the set has to have equivalence, meaning it has the same distance and the same slope. So that is the, that's the definition of a vector. Example, so here's the first type of thing that you'll be doing um, with me, if it makes sense, great. If not, there are a couple in the book that I suggest that you try if you're struggling with this. Prove that directed line segments are equivalent. In order for directed line segments to be equivalent, they need the same magnitude and direction. That's by definition, okay? So let U be represented by the direct line segment that goes from... P to Q. You know P is the start and Q is the terminal because the arrow always tells you the direction that you traveled. So if I am looking at U, okay, so these are vectors that would match this magnitude as well as this direction. The points, the initial point is 0, 0. The terminal point is 3, 2. Okay, we want vector V to be represented by this line segment. So it's gonna be a bunch of directed line segments in a common area that have the same direction and magnitude as this. The starting point is R, one, two. The terminal point is four, four. So if we are to prove that these two vectors are equal to one another, meaning they're equivalent, they have to have the same magnitude in the same direction. So to check for magnitude, you do the distance formula. So I take the second x, three, minus the first x, zero, quantity squared. The second y, two, minus the first y, zero, quantity squared. 
So this ends up being three minus zero is three, three squared is nine, plus two minus zero is two, two squared is four. So your magnitude, the length, is the square root of nine plus four, it's the square root of 13. Now to find the direction, the direction is the slope. So it's the second y minus the first y over the second x minus the first x. So this vector has a direction of two thirds, so meaning it goes up two over three, up two over three, and that's how it continues to travel. It has a magnitude or a length of the square root of 13. Now if these two vectors are equal, vector v would have to have the same magnitude in the same direction. So let's check it out. Distance formula. The second x4 minus the first x1 quantity squared plus the second y4 minus the first y2 quantity squared. 4 minus 1 is 3. 3 squared is 9. Plus 4 minus 2 is 2. 2 squared is 4. The magnitude, the length, the distance is the square root of 9 plus 4. That's 13. That checks. They have the same magnitude. Now let's check the direction. The second y minus the first y over the second x minus the first x. 4 minus 2 is 2 over 4 minus 1 is 3. They have the same magnitude. They have the same direction. You just proved that vector u and vector v are equivalent to one another. Now this is a really big skill for 6.3, so I do want to do another one, okay? So we're gonna do one more just to make sure we've got it. If you're still struggling, the suggested assignment, um, what I did throughout this because there's so many different ideas, you will notice where the suggested assignment is gonna be within the notes today versus at the end. So if you need more practice on this idea to prove that two vectors are equivalent, you wanna try number one that's on page 433, okay? Let's go again. We wanna prove that vector u, and we can see that that's u right here. So here's where it starts, here's where it ends. You have to look and see where the arrow is. It shows you the direction. So for vector u, the initial point where you start is at zero, four. Your terminal point where you end is at negative three, negative four. Now vector v, we are trying to go ahead and try to prove that they're the same. Your initial point is at three, three. Your terminal point is at zero, negative five. So I always start off that way. If you are trying to prove that they are equal, meaning they're equivalent, they have to have the same magnitude and they have to have the same direction. So to check for magnitude, you use the distance formula. Second x, negative three minus first x, zero, quantity squared, plus second y minus the first y, quantity squared. Well, negative three minus zero is negative three. Negative three squared is nine. Plus, negative four minus four more is negative eight. Negative eight squared is positive 64. So the magnitude would be the square root of 73. The direction, the direction is the slope. So the second y minus the first y over the second x minus the first x. Negative four minus four more is negative eight. Negative three minus zero is negative three. Negative over a negative cancels, so the direction is eight thirds. So that's pretty steep. That's pretty steep. Um, you're going up eight over three in order to continue with your line. If you were to turn this line segment into a line, that's what you would get. Okay, let's keep on going. So I have my direction and I have my magnitude. Now in order for these to be equivalent, this has to be the same. So I'm going to go ahead and check the magnitude. The second x zero minus the first x three quantity squared plus the second y negative five minus the first y positive three quantity squared, okay? So it's zero minus three, negative five minus three. Zero minus three is negative three, negative three squared is nine. Plus negative five minus three more is negative eight, 
negative 8 squared is positive 64. Check this out. 9 plus 64 is 73. The magnitudes check. But you cannot say that they're equal unless both magnitude and direction are the same. So now I need to do the slope formula. Negative 5 minus 3. Second y minus first y. Over second x minus first x. 0 minus 3. Negative 5 minus 3 is a negative 8. 0 minus 3 is a negative 3. Negative over a negative becomes a positive 8 thirds. The directions match. The magnitudes match. You just proved that vector u is equivalent to vector v. That is skill number one. Again, if you struggled with either of those two examples, the suggested assignment would be to go ahead and do number one. It's on page 433 in your textbook. Okay, now we're going to go on to a different idea. This is called the component form of a vector. The directed line segment whose initial point where it starts is the origin is obviously the most convenient. If you can start at zero, zero, it's going to give you nice numbers to work with. It's going to be the most convenient representative of a set of equivalent directed line segments. Okay, so the component form. This representative of vector v is in, is in what's called standard position. So again, think about graphing in standard position when we graphed our angles. In order to be in standard position, your vertex was at zero, zero. Same type of idea. Your starting point, the first thing that you're going to put is zero, zero. And that's where you would start your directed line segment that is representing that vector. A vector whose initial point is at the origin can be uniquely represented by coordinates of its terminal point. Okay, so the terminal point. This is what we're going to look at now. This is called the component form of vector v. And it's written like this. So the component form. This means that this would be the terminal point if your initial point is at zero, zero. Notice it's not an ordered pair. Yes, it resembles an ordered pair. In a lot of ways, it resembles an ordered pair, but you have to make sure that you're correctly writing it where rather than rounded brackets at the end, you do have those squared or um, triangular brackets. In this format, coordinates V sub one and V sub two are the components of, of vector V. Now, I know this is a lot of information, and as we do the math, you guys, it, it gets easier. I just knew today would be a lot of info. If both the initial point and the terminal point lie at the origin, so what that means is you have your coordinate plane, the first point is here, the second point is also there. This is called a zero vector because you didn't move anywhere. You started and you ended at the same spot. So that would be your component form your x value, your y value. You stayed right there, okay? Using this general information, we have the formula for the component form of a vector. Now this is fun, okay? You have to make sure that you start off with your initial point. Where are you starting? And your terminal point comes second. So it's P travels to Q. Your component form, you take Q sub 1, so the x value for the terminal point minus the x value for your initial point. So it's like the second x minus the first x. That is your new x. Then to find your y value, it's the second y minus the first y. So you're minusing the x's, then minusing the y's. So it would look like this. Again, the component form has that triangular edge. What you're doing is representing a vector. If you're doing this, you guys notice this is like the same thing as the distance formula. Second x minus first x. So if you're going to find the magnitude, once you have it in this component form, it's going to be much shorter because in order to get your v sub 1, you did q sub 1 minus p sub 1. You did your second x minus your first x. So you just have to take that value and square it. Plus, to find this value, it was the second part of the distance formula. Second y minus first y. You know that value, so you just have to go ahead and square it. If this seems confusing to you and you're like, ah, this is just a shortcut. If you don't like the shortcut, you can always go ahead and do the full distance formula, okay? These are shortcuts. 
if your magnitude, when you find your magnitude, if it's a one, it's called a unit vector. So think again of the unit circle. The reason why it's called a unit circle is because the radius anywhere on that circle is one. If it's a unit vector, that means its magnitude is a one. If your magnitude is a zero, that means it's a zero vector because the way that happened is right here. Your initial point and your terminal point were at the exact same spot. So how much do you travel? Nothing. Zero. Okay. If you're wondering where the heck I got all this information, I know like some of you guys like to see the proofs and read about the background stories. Um, page 425 in your textbook. That's where I got all this information that I put in the notes for you. Okay. Two vectors. Oh, this is fun, you guys. Okay. So two vectors. Again, this is vector notation. So this represents the distance from zero to the terminal point, because remember, if we're saying unit vector, that means our starting point is at zero, zero. So this is the x value, how much you're going left or right to get to the terminal point. This is the y value, how much are you going up or down to get to the terminal point. Same thing for v. These are two different vectors, that just means we're looking at two different line segments. And again, these are equal if and only if their x values are the same and their y values are the same. So fun. Okay, so we want to prove that vector u and vector v are equal. So again, we're going to have to go ahead and look at their component form. So we'll have to look at each directed line segment. It starts at p and it ends at q. So if I am finding the component form for u, it is the second x minus the first x. So 3 minus 0, that's going to be my u sub 1, the x value for the component form. Then you do the same thing for the y's. It's the second y minus the first y, 2 minus 0. So my component form, 3 minus 0 is 3, 2 minus 0 is 2. That is the component form. So if I were to put the initial point at 0, 0 in order to recreate that directed line segment, you would have to have your terminal point go to the right 3 up 2, and that would be your direct in line segment. Now we have to see if V is the same. Okay, now V, in order to say that they're equal, they have to have the same X values and the same Y values. You're starting at R and ending at S. So this is your first point, this is your second point. So you take your second X minus your first X, you take your second Y minus your first Y. So I have four minus one, that's a three. Four minus two, that's a two. Your x value in component form matches. Your y value in component form matches. So you just proved that vector u and vector v are equal. They have the exact same component form. And that's what it would take for two vectors to be equal looking at it in this format. Okay, let's look at another one. Finding the component form of a vector. And that's what we just did, you guys. Kind of fun. Find the component form, then we're going to go ahead and look at that shortcut for magnitude. If you do not like the shortcut, you can always, 100% of the time, go to the distance formula. You'll get the same answer, okay? So initial point is 4, negative 7. I just like to write them next to each other. Terminal point is negative 1, 5. So if I am finding the component form for vector v, I take the second x minus the first x. That's going to give me the x value, or that first component the second y minus the first y, and that would be my second component, is what they call them. Negative one minus four is a negative five. Five minus a negative seven. If you minus a negative, you're actually adding, so that's a 12. So that is the component form. So in order to move or recreate this directed line segment, your initial point is at zero, zero. That's what you know when you have these triangular sides. That means you're starting at zero, zero. This point is where you're ending. So you'd have to go to the left five and up 12. That would be the directed line segment. If I want to find the magnitude, this is already a portion of the distance formula. So if I subtract or, yeah, if I go ahead and subtract these two, I get a negative five. Well, negative five squared is 25. Plus, if I subtract the two y's, I end up with 12. Then you square it, you get 144. So that's what this formula is saying, is once you know the component form, you square the first component plus square the second component, and now you're already this far in the distance formula. 
25 plus 144 is 169. The square root of 169 is 13. So that means from the point 0, 0 to the point negative 5, 12, there are exactly 13 units between the two points. Awesome. Let's do another one. Again, this is a main skill. So anything that I felt that you really, really needed to understand, if this makes sense, awesome. Give yourselves a pat on the back. If you want a little bit more practice on um, component form and magnitude, 3 through 11, just looking at the odds in your textbook will help a lot. Okay. Find the component form and the magnitude. This time it's vector u. Yes, I see the points there, but you guys, I'm weird. You know that. I don't have to tell you that. Um, <laughs> I like to have them side by side. So this is where you start. The terminal point is right here. So if I am finding the component form, to find the first component, which is your x, your horizontal component, it is 3 minus a negative 1. Now the same thing for the y values. 5 minus a negative 1. 3 minus a negative 1. If you ever minus a negative, you're actually adding. So 3 plus 1 is 4. 5 minus a negative 1. If you minus a negative, you're adding. 5 plus 1 is 6. That's your component form. So in order to recreate that directed line segment, your starting point is at 0, 0. Your terminal point is at 4, 6. Now to find the magnitude, what is the length? It is the square root of each component squared separately, so 4 squared is 16, and then you add them. 6 squared is 36. If I take 16 plus 36, I get the square root of 52. That's not perfect, so you got to break it down if you can. 52 is the same as 2 times 26. 26 is 2 times 13. I can cross off 2, 2, so I can write 1, 2 on the outside. Your magnitude is 2 times the square root of 13. So again, if you understood these two, how to find the component form, how to calculate the magnitude from that, awesome. If you want a little bit more practice, 3 through 11 odds in the textbook are great questions. Last idea for the day. And guys, i got to be honest, these notes are taking way less time than I thought. I figured we'd be another 50-minute notes here, and we won't. We're almost done. Okay. There are vector operations. So just like you can take numbers, you can take functions, you can take trig functions, and you can add them and subtract them and multiply them and factor them. When you're working with vectors, there are two basic things that you can do. Obviously, they alter them, giving you more operations. But the two basic operations are scalar multiplication. The other place in your mathematical career so far that you've done scalar multiplying is when we did matrices. The scalar was the number that you multiplied to every entry in the matrix. So a scalar means you're going to basically distribute a value into the component form. Okay, and vector addition. Vector sum. So if you are doing vector addition, if you want to take vectors um, u and v and add them together, you add the x component to get a new x component, you add the y component to get the new y component. So you're adding the x's, adding the y's, and you're done. If you're doing scalar multiplying, you just take that c, whatever your scalar value is, and you distribute it. It gets multiplied to both the x and the y. Okay, obviously, you might have a negative. So if you want a negative um, of vector v, it's the same thing as multiplying by a negative 1. So you'd be distributing that negative. You would just be changing the signs. If you want to find the difference, remember the difference is adding a negative. So it's the same thing as this. So technically, it's still a vector operation. It's technically addition. If you add a negative, though, you only have to show it as a minus. So you would subtract the two x's, subtract the two y's. Okay, we're going to go ahead and do a few of these. This, to me, is where it gets kind of fun. You get to actually just kind of do some little calculations. The numbers are not going to be too rough because every component form only has two numbers. So if I want 2 times vector v, and they're telling us vector v is negative 2, 5. This is the component form. This is scalar multiplying. So all you're doing is distributing that 2 into your component, giving you negative 4, positive 10. You're done. That's it. If you want W minus V, make sure you go in the correct order. So W is 3, 4, minus component V is negative 2, 5. So if you are subtracting them, 
Take the x values and minus them. 3 minus a negative 2. If you minus a negative, you're actually adding. So 3 plus 2 is 5. 4 minus 5 is negative 1. There's your solution and you're done. Okay, the next one. They have v, which is negative 2, 5, plus 2 times w, 3, 4. Order of operations apply when you're working with vectors. I'm not going to add until after I multiply. So I have negative 2, 5, plus 2 times 3 is 6, 2 times 4 is 8. Now I will do vector addition. Negative 2 plus 6 is 4, 5 plus 8 is 13, and you're done. Last one. I have 2 times vector v, negative 2, 5, minus 3 times vector w, 3, 4. Okay, so again, we are going to multiply before we worry about subtracting. So before I worry about the difference, I'm going to distribute a 2 into the first component form and distribute a 3 into the second component form. So this becomes negative 4 and 10. I just multiplied both of these values by 2. Minus, now I'm going to go ahead and multiply in a 3. 3 times 3 is 9. 3 times 4 is 12. Now I can hear some of you right now. I honestly can. It's kind of funny. You could distribute a negative, making this negative 9, negative 12. But if you bring the negative in with, you would have to change this to a plus. So what I chose to do is keep this as a negative and just distribute the 3. If you distribute a negative 3, you're not doing it incorrectly. This would become a negative 9 and a negative 12, but if you do that, you have to make sure that you change that into a plus because you brought the negative in with you, okay? Either option is right. I like to just bring in the number and keep the minus the way that it is, okay? Let's keep going. Negative 4 minus 9 more. Well, that's a negative 13, okay? If I look at the next one, 10 minus 12 is a negative 2. So you have negative 13 and negative 2. Those are vector operations. If you want more practice on this, whether it's challenging or maybe you thought this was fun. If you like doing vector operations in your textbook, 25 to 29 odds would be some great ones to try. Um, just to kind of end for our day, just kind of pointing some things out. This is another chart that was in your book. It says properties of vector addition and scalar multiplication. When you are looking at doing operations with vectors, you guys check out these properties. These properties have been with you since like fifth grade and they continue even when you're working with vectors. Here's the commutative property. You can change the order when you're adding or multiplying. Here's your additive identity. If you add a zero to something, it keeps its own identity. This is the associative property. You can change your grouping symbols and that's right here. Additive inverses, if you add opposites, you get to a zero. Distributive property, all of these properties that we have looked at all the way throughout your mathematical career, they also hold true for vectors. So I just thought that was a really cool thing to point out. There is a Zoom meeting tomorrow as well as a worksheet workday. So you do get another day just to sit on these concepts. Um, if you have any questions at all, go ahead, join me on the Zoom meeting. I'll answer questions from the suggested assignment, as well as any questions you may have as you're working through the worksheet. I hope you guys enjoyed day one of Vectors, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.